joining us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Elizabeth Ridley Field is one of our alums, and she's now a professor at sociology um, in the Affiliate of the Population uh, Center at University of Minnesota, where she actually teaches their demographic methods courses. So if all your toil in 756 could come back to help you someday, right? Yeah. Um, Elizabeth is really uh, an exemplary uh, person to bring in for a whole number of reasons, but one of the things is that she built um, part of her research agenda here as a student, largely without the help of everyone else, right? I mean, this is something she sort of pursued, a question that she found interesting, and thought about how to build an analysis to answer these questions that she thought were interesting in a way that it wasn't sort of a standard tool that we trained you in. Is that fair? I th yeah, that's fair. Okay. And um, and so she uses sim simulation to great effect in her in her research to help us think about standard puzzles in demography that we think we have an interpretation for. Elizabeth helps us think about why that interpretation may be incorrect, and that you know in turn that influences a lot about how we think about how processes of inequality are working in society. So. So really a demographic analysis that informs something very important about social inequality in the social world. Um, the other thing I'll say is that Elizabeth's work is exquisitely done, exceptionally careful, um, and so you know I'm sure she could share code from her previous papers and all of these sorts of things. And she's published her work in demography. It's won several awards, um, as well as the Vienna Yearbook for Population Research. Um, and you know, I think for many reasons then it's great to have her come tell us a little bit about process and a little bit about um, the kinds of questions that she's pursuing now. Okay. So thank you so much for joining us. And do, do you thank want to take questions throughout? Yeah. Okay. Interrupt freely. Um, so I'm going to present some work uh, without simulations and then spend a bunch of time talking about where the simulations fit in to, um, to bolster what I'm going to show you first without them. Um, so we think mortality disparities really matter, uh, partly because what matters more to us than who lives or who dies, but also because we think that they reflect something deep about what happens to people while they're still alive. Here are a few years of uh, mortality for a cohort of black and white women in their early 80s, so it is not surprising to us that black women have higher death rates than white women. We think that reflects the many disadvantages that blacks experience. But now look just a few years longer. Above age 87 for this cohort, black women have lower mortality than white women. Uh, this is the black-white mortality crossover. So should we now conclude that at very old ages, black women are suddenly living in conditions of privilege compared to their white counterparts? Um, that question might sound funny. It's actually the conclusion that was reached um, in a consequential set of analyses by the economic historian Robert William Fogel. So demographers know Fogel primarily for three contributions, each of which spawned whole new research fields, right? So these were uh, major contributions. Um, his argument that nutritional status is both a cause and a consequence of health and infectious disease, his pioneering use of anthropometric data like heights uh, to uh, proxy health where we don't have good data, and his analysis of the political economy of slavery. And there was just one empirical analysis that was at the center of all all three strands of that work. Um, and that's his analysis of mortality and also related measures uh, of health, like height, uh, of slaves compared to whites in the antebellum South. And the analysis was based on data like this. So in this table, uh, Fogel is showing us the excess mortality for black slaves compared to free whites in the antebellum South. Uh, we probably all think that slavery is unhealthy for the slaves, and indeed, Fogel is finding um, that in infancy and early childhood, slaves were far more likely to die than whites. A uh, really big disparity. But now just look a little bit farther. The disparity seems to disappear, and by age 20, it's reversed. So do we conclude that for adults, being enslaved is irrelevant to your health? Um, well, Fogel reached a conclusion something along those lines. So his argument was that the nutritional deprivation of slavery really, really matters in early childhood, but just isn't that consequential for adults. Um, and he, uh, this w because it was puzzling to him, this became the center of many, many new analyses that he did to try to um, bolster this conclusion. Um, he really puzzled over this. And with all due respect to those analyses, I don't know about you, I find that conclusion implausible. 
But luckily, we do not need to follow Fogel to that conclusion. Um, there is an alternative that comes out of demographic theory that hopefully some of you have encountered already, um, and that is that alternative is mortality selection. And the premise of mortality selection is the idea that all social groups contain heterogeneities, uh, inequalities in the risk of dying. So in this very stylized language, we say some people are frail and other people are robust, and as a cohort ages, its frail members die first. This change in the cohort's composition due to mortality, that's mortality selection. And its consequence is that mortality is lower than it would have been because the frailest people, the highest risk people, are missing. Now this language of frail and robust tends to capture this very biological imagery of like sickly frail people and strapping robust people. Um, but the way that I actually want you to understand this is that frailty is the assemblage of all of the things that might make someone more likely to die than another that are also pretty stable over their life course. So when I say frailty, what I want you to actually hear is embodied disadvantages. It's the assemblage of things like, do you smoke, did you go to college, do you experience discrimination on a daily basis? Do you have a criminal record? Were you born low birth weight? Are you exposed to toxic chemicals in your neighborhood? You know, whatever you want. Um, but things that are pretty stable about you. <coughs> now here's the key. Uh, all social groups contain these invisible inequalities. Um, so there's frail and robust blacks and there's frail and robust whites, but not all groups are equally selected by mortality. Social groups that have higher mortality, like blacks compared to whites, are selected more intensely because their mortality is higher. So the intuition is just, if you live to be 90 years old in the condition that black people are forced to live in in the United States, you had to have something very special about you in order to live so long in a way that is simply not required of white people to live so long. And that means that when we look at old ages and we compare blacks and whites uh, and we think we're learning something about their current circumstances, uh, we're actually comparing this very selected group of whites, of blacks rather, to a much broader cross-section of whites. It is an inherently biased uh, comparison. Um, right, so from this perspective, whites White's high mortality in old ages is a sign not of an old age disadvantage, but of the accumulated advantages of a lifetime, right? So this is the theory, um, and this is all background. What I wanna do is ask a question about what happens when this theory meets modern demographic data um, in which we have rich covariate measures um, that can capture parts of what we mean uh, when we talk about something like frailty, but don't capture the whole thing. Uh, and I'm gonna give, you, normally when I talk about this project, I actually spend a lot of time sort of motivating and setting up the question, uh, but I don't wanna do that because I wanna spend a lot of time instead talking about the simulations because that's why we're all here. Um, so instead of really motivating the question, I just wanna make sure that at least the question is understood. Um, so the question that I will be asking is, um, if we could measure some important part of the heterogeneity, so if this frailty, you know, that is this assemblage of stable traits that makes some people more likely to die than others in ways that are pretty stable, if we can measure some pieces of that, but we can't measure others, what happens to the crossover when we stratify on the parts that we measure? And in particular, I wanna ask, do we have a testable prediction of this theory, uh, this mortality selection theory, um, that if we could stratify on part of the heterogeneity, that that should push the crossover to an older age? Uh, because we would be partially equalizing the black and white populations. Uh, and I wanna argue that this um, way of proceeding, stratifying on part of the heterogeneity, um, matches what we often are starting to do with empirical data where we have uh, measurements of some real inequalities with, that stratify black and white populations, um, but also is not well-founded um, in demographic theory. And the reason that it is not, um, is that uh, this is uh, a, a, a multi-dimensional 
process, right? It's treating frailty as um, a, a, as a multidimensional construct, um, but it's drawing on an underlying theory um, ab about a unidimensional frailty, where frailty is treated as just one kind of thing. So what I'm going to do is build a multidimensional frailty model and ask what happens to the crossover when you stratify on just one of those dimensions. So, and just to give you the upshot in advance, I'm gonna argue that when you split frailty into pieces that are incompletely measured, neither the measured nor the unmeasured part ends up looking like the unidimensional frailty that you are used to if you think about, if you, if you read uh, demographic um, theory. So let me start with just this canonical unidimensional model um, that if you read in this area, you'll encounter uh, very quickly. Um, this is the canonical model of mortality selection with a single dimension of heterogeneity stratifying black and white subpopulations. So we're imagining that we have individuals that age with Gompert's mortality, so their mortality is increasing exponentially as they age. Race and frailty are fixed and binary. And conditional on frailty, blacks always have higher mortality than whites. So there's a racial disadvantage that is constant over age. It never goes away, and it's experienced by everybody. Because this is a unidimensional model, and it's very stylized, everyone's mortality is perfectly described by their race, their frailty, and their age. So these subpopulations are homogenous. And the picture on the white is showing um, what the logged mortality looks like. Sorry that it's a little bit, um, uh, not the easiest to, uh, to, to read on the screen. Um, but the um, whites are in blue and blacks are in tan and the frail are the dashed lines. So you can see that the blacks have higher mortality but the frail robust difference <laughs> is actually a lot bigger. And, and, that's a, and that's a precondition for the crossover. So at the aggregate level, the racial difference in mortality is a trade-off between the fact that conditional on frailty, blacks are always disadvantaged, but as the cohort gets older, blacks are less and less likely to be frail. Uh, and so the picture on the right is the proportion frail for blacks and for whites. And you can see that uh, for most of the age span, whites are uh, more likely to be frail than blacks are. Um, uh, in fact, that's true at all ages, but it becomes inconsequential as the numbers get closer and closer to zero. Okay, and this trade-off can produce a crossover. So here is the aggregate disparity in mortality formally. Within each frail group, uh, blacks have higher mortality. So these terms on the left are the extent to which black mortality is higher than white mortality uh, for the frail and the robust, weighted by the proportion of the population uh, that's frail and robust uh, among blacks. Um, and then, um, but mortality selection is making a more robust group of white survivors than black survivors. And so these terms on the right are the white-black difference in the percent frail weighted by how much that matters uh, to mortality. Um, and the key is that all of these terms have known sign. And that's what lets us reason qualitatively about the role that frailty is playing or that mortality selection is playing in aggregate mortality. Um, that's gonna be important. So this model is where all of our intuitions about the crossover come from. And now, I wanna use that as a jumping off point for a new model. Um, which makes it more complicated in just one small step. So now we have two fixed forms of heterogeneity. Blacks and whites can be exposed to tobacco in utero or not, and they can also be residually frail or robust. And this is just like the unidimensional model. All I did is split that frailty multiplier into these two parts, a part that's about tobacco exposure and a part that's the residual of that. Uh, and, and, and people can be frail on one or the other or both or neither of these. Mortality selection against tobacco exposure and against this residual frailty, they might both contribute to this crossover that we observe. 
Right, and so this is an intentionally very, very simple multidimensional model um, because the, the idea is to think about what is the scope for testable predictions here, not in a complicated setting, but in the simplest possible multidimensional setting. Now here's the question. So just like in empirical research, we wanna imagine that tobacco exposure in utero is observed in some data that we have, but residual frailty is not. And we wanna know what happens to the age at crossover when we stratify on the observed part of the heterogeneity, that tobacco exposure. Does the age at crossover move up or does it move down? If this were the unidimensional model, we would know two things about frailty. The frail have higher mortality than the robust, uh, and more surviving whites than blacks are frail, right? That's what makes the crossover. And if we could extend those two facts to the two dimensions of this multidimensional frailty, so if we could say that's those same two things are gonna be true about tobacco exposure and they're gonna be true about residual frailty, um, then we would say, okay, well, the tobacco exposed have higher mortality than the non-exposed, and whites are gonna have more tobacco exposed survivors than blacks because the black tobacco exposed are gonna be selected out of the population. And so we would reason that conditioning on tobacco exposure is gonna lower white mortality more than black mortality, <laughs> and that should give us a pushed out, a delayed crossover. Does that reasoning all make sense? Does that seem intuitive? If, if we could make these same generalizations, whites, uh, tobacco exposed have higher mortality, white survivors are more likely to be exposed to tobacco, then conditioning on tobacco should uh, reduce white mortality more than black mortality. Right. The problem is that neither of these two generalizations needs to be true. So first of all, do the tobacco exposed always have higher mortality than the non-exposed? No, because th these are groups that are aggregated over this residual frailty, so they can have a crossover just like whites and blacks do. Um, so we can call that a frailty crossover, and this is just a very, um, this is actually um, not much of an extension uh, of what we already knew at all. It's just a, looking at it in a slightly different context. Here's a more interesting one. Uh, are white survivors necessarily more likely than black survivors to be exposed to tobacco, and are they more likely to be residually frail? And again, the answer is not necessarily. And this point is more subtle, but also more interesting. Um, and the formulas are pretty complex, so I'll just give you the intuition. But the idea is, um, just like unidimensional mortality selection creates this negative association between race and frailty, between being black and being frail. So that association wasn't there at birth, it gets created through the selection process. Um, in just the same way, multidimensional mortality selection creates this negative association within each race between tobacco exposure and residual frailty. So our two dimensions of frailty become negatively associated with one another. And that negative association can become so strong that selecting against one disadvantage is actually selecting for the other disadvantage. And that can lead to all kinds of things um, that feel surprising if you're used to thinking about mortality selection um, in, in, a, in a more simple or unidimensional context. It can lead a dimension of disadvantage not just to decrease over age, but to increase over age through mortality selection, which I call a frailty increase, or it can lead along one dimension um, blacks to be less heavily selected than whites are, which I call a frailty reversal.
So here you can see um, this is the proportion residually frail for blacks and whites in a simulated cohort, and I'm going to say more about the simulations in just a moment, but this is just for illustration. You can see that residual frailty increases here for both races, and that there's this reversal where the gold line for blacks uh, is higher. So what's happening here is that the selection against tobacco exposure in this case uh, is leading um, both races, but particularly blacks, to become more and more frail in this other residual sense. Uh, and when this happens, it is always to the dimension with a weaker effect on mortality because it's being driven by um, stronger selection against the other dimension. Um, so blacks are always going to be more selected than whites against the strongest dimension of heterogeneity, but not necessarily uh, for both. And so I just want to underscore what a departure this is uh, from the unidimensional selection model of the crossover, um, because they're the one thing that we really, really know is that surviving blacks are less frail than surviving whites. That's the entire point of the model. Um, but that point does not generalize to the individual dimensions of disadvantage um, in a multidimensional model. So now the question is, what does this mean for the crossover order? Here's the racial difference in aggregate mortality and in form. This is exactly the same as the uh, racial difference that I showed you before. Um, so we have a racial difference in mortality among the tobacco exposed, weighted by the proportion of blacks that are exposed, and among the non-exposed, weighted by the proportion that are not exposed. And then we've got this white-black difference in tobacco exposure, weighted by how much of a difference that makes to mortality. How, how much higher mortality do the exposed have to the non-exposed, right? So same, same model form. Um, but the difference is, in the unidimensional case, we knew in advance the sign of every single term in this model. We knew this, the ones on the left were positive and the ones on the right were negative. Now, we don't know the sign of a single one of these terms. So the racial differences in the subpopulations can take either sign because the subpopulations could have their own black-white crossover or not. Um, that's not a problem. Um, and the aggregate can diverge from the subpopulations because of this compositional term on the right. Um, so, so far, so good. What we want to know is, um, w does this compositional term on the right lead the aggregate to diverge from the subpopulations in a predictable way um, or not? Because that would tell us, is it creating an early crossover in the aggregate or a late crossover in the aggregate? And that's that testable prediction that we have been looking for. But that compositional term can also take either sign because either, either one of its terms are. So either the tobacco exposed or the non-exposed could turn out to be the high mortality group in the ages that we're looking at, uh, and that's because they could have a, a crossover um, or not. Um, and whichever one it is that has higher mortality survivors, either blacks or whites could end up having more of them in the age span that we're looking at because of this um, potential for a frailty reversal, because of the selection along multiple dimensions to produce um, the opposite direction of selection that we expect along any one dimension. And that's why the crossover order is unpredictable. Um, so it could be the case that being exposed to tobacco means you have higher mortality and whites are more likely to be exposed than blacks when you look only at survivors. And so stratifying on tobacco exposure reduces white mortality more than blacks um, and, and, uh, and, and creates um, a later crossover like we expected. But it also could be the exact opposite of that. Um, so it could be um, that the tobacco exposed have become the lower mortality case or that whites have fewer of them and that actually the stratification is going to do the opposite of what we would have expected. Okay. So this is all the non-simulation. This is the kind of point of the argument that I want to make. So why do I need simulations? Um, in order to make this argument um, more compelling. So 
one reason is sort of specific to this particular project. Um, although actually it, it's, it's in a broader category that's not. So we use simulations, the broad category is we use simulations to get results that for one reason or another we can't really get analytically. Um, and what that means in this case is, so when I showed you the equations before, there was a kind of simplification um, built, or almost like a sleight of hand built into them, which is that when I talk about the crossover order, I'm talking about the order in which events happen, right? Like it's a particular age where black mortality falls below white mortality. But the equations I showed you were not talking about age, they were talking about being in a particular state of having a crossover or not having a crossover. And so you should worry from these equations um, that maybe what's happening is that I'm showing you correctly that you could be in a situation where the subpopulations have a crossover but the aggregate does not. But it's not because the subpopulations reached a crossover first, but it's because the aggregate mortality had a crossover and now is no longer in a crossover state. The equations I showed you haven't ruled that out. Um, and the reason why I gave equations that didn't rule those out is that giving equations about the age at crossover is actually vastly more complex. In a different project where I wanted to do it, I had to bring in an outside mathematician and he could only do part of it. So it's actually really hard um, to, to do. So that's why I did this in this simplified way. But now I need simulations to confirm that what I'm seeing is not just an artifact of that, uh, that simplification. So that's one thing. The second thing is, so I've shown you that when you compare the age at crossover with and without stratifying on some observable heterogeneity like tobacco exposure, um, that the crossover age could move in any which way, right? It could move to an older age, it could move to a younger age. Um, and so the direction that it moves in is not a very good test of a heterogeneity model. But the next question that you might ask is, well, okay, but just because the crossover order, any, any order of movement is possible in principle, that doesn't mean it's really possible in practice. Maybe some of these possibilities only actually occur in a very constrained parameter space that's so crazy that we never have to worry about it. And so we could make more localized predictions that in practice will work just fine. So the second reason to look at simulations is to see whether that's true. And the third reason which is related to that is to try to empirically validate the model. And I am gonna say that I have very mixed feelings about this one. Um, and for a long time I was actually very dismissive about it in this context. And the reason is that this is not a realistic model of human populations, right? Like, People are homogenous except along these two fixed dimensions plus their race, so three fixed, like this is not a realistic model of human populations. And the way that I think about the value of this work is that it's doing something, and by the way, they're all binary. Like it, I think of this as doing something theoretically prior to doing the kind of model you would want to empirically calibrate, which is basically just to see like what theoretical possibilities are out there that we should be worried about and then have to figure out how much are they actually gonna come up uh, in real situations that we care about. Um, so that's fine, like if I, you know, I can say I'm focused on showing conceptual possibilities, but there's also some real tension between that and saying, well, I wanna look for local predictions and see, you know, so there was something sort of inconsistent about what I was saying here, and so I've more and more sort of, um, come around to thinking that even though I don't think this is a good or empirically viable model, it is actually important to look and to think about still how would I calibrate, uh, calibrate or validate it and, and what does that give me? And so in this case, I think there's two ways that I can think about that. Um, and one, I'm calling them here micro and macro and I actually think that's not the right term, so I'll say more about that in a sec, but one is uh, more like parameters about how the lower level aggregates relate to each other. So things like how high is the mortality of the frail compared to the robust? How high does it have to be to get these patterns? And is it just like crazy or is it something that we might think is reasonable? How many people have to be tobacco exposed? Things like that. And the other, which on the slide I called macro, is basically like, does the entire population end up looking something like a real population? Um, does it look even potentially something like the United States? 
um, even a little bit. And so uh, probably better terminology here would be like before the fact or after the fact, right? So there's the before the fact, uh, the parameters that are the inputs that I put into the model, do they seem crazy off the bat? And after the fact, is the, are the results that I get back uh, somewhat reasonable or not? Um, so let's start with that before the fact. So the parameter space I used um, primarily was designed to find crossovers. Um, so let me say something about that. It's very hard to calibrate what is a large or a small penalty for frailty um, because the whole point is that it's this unobserved theoretical construct. And what's more, it's supposed to represent this whole package of all of these different things that matter to mortality. And so how do you have a sense of how big that can be? Um, I don't really know. So right, so it's like by, by modeling this as a single dimension, it's like we're imagining that all these differences between people kind of cluster together into this single omni disadvantage. And uh, similarly, I've been talking about tobacco exposure, but that term also you could think of as a whole amalgam of all the traits that actually would be observed in a data set, which could be any number of things, and then clustering that into a single dimension of advantage or disadvantage as well, right? So the point is just we have an observed and an unobserved dimension to heterogeneity. So we have these mortality penalties, but it's very hard to think about how big they should be. Um, but now having said that, you know, we don't have a good sense of what's a big mortality penalty. Uh, it, having said that, it actually takes a big mortality penalty um, to get a crossover in the first place. And so the classic mortality selection paper, um, Heterogeneity's Ruses, actually uses this pretty extreme black frailty interaction to get this nice crossover picture. Um, the penalty for being frail is four times higher for blacks than for whites in this model, um, and that's where this sort of canonical picture comes from. And in contrast, the models that I'm using don't have any interactions, so being frail and being black are the same disadvantage whether you're black or you're white. Um, so as a result, um, I need frailty multipliers that are pretty much at the extreme of what you find for standard demographic variables. So the example cohorts that I showed you earlier have frailty multipliers around four, which is slightly more than the sex difference for old people in post-transition Russian mortality. So as far as like a single demographic variable goes, like that's a really big one. But I've been trying to think about how do you know what's reasonable, not just for a single variable, but for an amalgam. So one thing I looked at was this classic paper that proposed um, what's now called the Charlson Index or the Charlson Comorbidity Score, uh, which is basically a score of how bad is your chronic disease burden. Um, so the idea being that like people could have all, all manner of different things wrong with them, but regardless of what it is, you could just kind of count them up and get a pretty good predictor of how sick people are. Um, and so in that paper, they found that um, each additional chronic burden gives you a mortality relative risk of a little less than one and a half, which is similar to a decade of age. And then because chronic disease burdens and age decades had about the same effect, they actually put them together into a combined score that worked pretty well at predicting mortality. Um, and so, you know, basically like for every additional disease you have like diabetes or heart disease or something like that, arthritis, relatively serious ones, you get a point and you also get a point for being a decade or older. And so four points increases your mortality by about four, factor of four and a half, five points, uh, six and a third, six points, nine and a quarter. Right, so these are both big disadvantages and big mortality penalties. So that maybe gives some idea to calibrate what I'm about to tell you. Um, so in my simulations, um, in order to, sim in order to, first of all, to find crossovers in the cohorts, I make the mortality multipliers on being tobacco exposed and residually frail really large. So they range from two all the way up to eight. Um, and the multiplier on being black is much smaller. At maximum, it's two. Um, and these, um, these mortality multipliers on being black actually are like, the 1.05 is way too small, but they're basically consistent with, um, 
uh, life tables, uh, US life tables at young ages. Um, so I also looked at a range of baseline proportions, frail or tobacco exposed, and this I really have no theory about. I just started them at pretty high values because uh, otherwise they go extinct too quickly in the models because their mortality is so high. And so this list of parameters gives me everything that I need in order to answer questions about when crossovers happen in relation to each other, whether there's a frailty reversal or a frailty increase and so on. And when I say this list of parameters, I really just mean these mortality multipliers and these baseline proportions, this uh, baseline distribution of who's in what group. I don't mean uh, the alpha and the beta that scale the underlying mortality risk. Um, I do not need a mortality intercept or a mortality log slope to generate any of the results um, that I have shown you and to answer any of these questions. And the reason I don't is that I can treat the survivorship of any of the groups as the clock um, in which uh, all of these relationships are measured. Um, so uh, survivorship and age are monotonic, though not linear transformations of each other, right? Like survivorship on a closed cohort is always decreasing at every age. It never increases. Um, and so the way that I simulate these, partly for computational reasons, um, is I use as the clock the survivorship of the lowest mortality group which is the robust, non-exposed whites, and then everything that's happening in mortality is just measured relative to that survivorship. Um, and by saving me two whole parameters in the parameter space, it actually makes a really big difference to how fast this runs. It's still, the simulations take about a week. Um, without those two parameters, it would be much, much, much longer with them. Um, so that's how I originally approached this. But if I want to do not just this kind of before the fact, how are my inputs okay, but do an after the fact, what kind of populations do I end up with, then it's not enough to look at the survivorships. I need to actually put, put these back into an age scale in order to be able to relate them to real populations. Um, and so in order to make them try to look reasonable, the, the way I'm thinking about that is in terms of if you took these um, aggregated populations that you end up with and did like, like ran a Gompertz model on them, would you get reasonable parameters? So, because these lower level parameters, like the frailty multipliers, these are all latent, right? We have no idea how to validate those. But we do know how to think about what aggregate populations look like. So in this graph, um, these are from the human mortality database all period life tables starting in 1933, because that's the first year of US data in the human mortality database. Um, so the yellow ones are all of the human mortality database cohorts. The pink are the United States. Um, and we have here, if you just run a Gompertz on each of these cohorts, a fitted intercept along the x-axis and a fitted slope along the y-axis. And so the question is, if I go in and apply an alpha and a beta um, to these uh, population models, can I, can I, is there an alpha and beta that I can find such that you get an aggregate that is somewhere in the range um, of these data? So it looks something like a real population. And this is similar to something I did um, in another paper where, um, here the gray dots are the human mortality database cohort life tables. The black, sorry, no, the black dots are the human mortality database cohort life table aggregate parameters. The gray dots are simulations I was doing for something else where I was basically showing that like the simulations that I found that were interesting in one way or another looked something like the aggregate data. Um, and in fact spanned the range of what real data look like in terms of these parameters. So in total, what I want from a simulation is something like this. I want reasonable inputs. Um, I want reasonable aggregate populations, meaning I want them to give me these um, population parameters, an intercept and slope that feel uh, 
not totally implausible and that put, that simultaneously put the crossover at a realistic age, so starting somewhere between 70 and 90. Um, and I also want the phenomena that I'm talking about to be not tiny blips, right? Like I want them to happen for some real span of ages. And so I'm pretty, it's, it's sort of preliminary doing these more aggregate um, simulations with the intercepts and slopes. But from what I've done so far, I would say there's a real trade-off between these desiderata where I could basically get like two or three of them at a time, but not all four uh, most of the time. So like for example, um, I can make simulated cohorts that have the aggregate crossover at the right ages. Uh, everything looks very dramatic. Um, they have a realistic aggregate slope for the contemporary United States, but the aggregate intercept is too large by a factor of 10, something like that. So um, that's, uh, that's the um, uh, simulation calibration, so you know kind of what these look like. And now, very quickly, um, what do I actually get for results? So. Remember, this, the point here is to see, is there a localized parameter space where I could find the predictions um, that I couldn't find in, the, in, you know, in theory? So in theory, the crossover can happen in any order, but actually is the order very constrained in a local space? It's not a mistake, by the way, that this plot is blank. I'm just giving you the setup. So here we're gonna compare cohorts that have the same baseline distributions of being tobacco exposed and being residually frail, but they vary in their mortality multipliers. And so where you're gonna see yellow dots, that means that at those baseline combinations, the cohorts always reach an aggregate crossover first. And where you will see pink dots, those kinds of cohorts always reach a subpopulation crossover first. So the yellow and the pink dots are what we want. And an orange dot means that either of these orders is possible at those uh, values, which means it's not very informative. So what do we find? Everything is orange. Um, so there is no baseline distribution here that cannot take either crossover order. Um, Okay, and what about the mortality multipliers? So now I'm looking at cohort sets that share their values of the mortality multipliers on being black, tobacco exposed, and residually frail, um, but they vary freely in their baseline distributions um, of how many people start out frail, how many people start out exposed. Um, so, and I'm showing you a particular, uh, anyway, they're all gonna look like this. Okay, so this is more promising, right? So above this line, we have orange again, where any order is, is possible, um, but below this diagonal line, we have this triangle where the aggregate is always crossing first. Um, but this bottom row isn't that surprising. So at these values, um, being black and being residually frail actually have the same mortality penalty. So there's no crossover at all within those subpopulations. You need a tobacco exposure difference to get a crossover. So that's why the aggregate is always crossing first there. It's actually crossing only. Um, and what about up here? So this triangle is more interesting. At these values, you never have the, cr the aggregate crossing last, um, but it doesn't have to cross before both subpopulations. A lot of the time it actually crosses um, in between them, um, in between the tobacco exposed and the non-exposed. So you know maybe there is some room for localized prediction here, um, but it's pretty specific um, and circumscribed. So where does this leave us? Uh, we looked at the multidimensional mortality selection model because we want to be able to use observed measures of heterogeneity to make predictions about, uh, about selection models and then test those predictions. Um, but it seems that actually the room that we have for making predictions um, in this extremely common situation where we can measure some heterogeneities that we care about but we can't measure others, the room we have for making testable predictions um, actually seems to be um, quite small. And yeah, I guess the only thing I'll say just to put this in context um, is that um, 
Part of why I was interested in this problem in the first place is that I think we have we are have this situation in formal demography where you know we have these very um, creative and compelling theories like the mortality selection theory um, that was really developed I think in this context of having really crappy data and figuring out how can you get the most insight possible from basically no data on what we think is going on and really being like incredibly smart and creative to figure out how to do that um, and that's why I think the formal demographic modeling tra uh, tradition has done really well but we also now have this situation where we have much better data that often has like real measures of inequalities that we think really matter and we have much more interesting stratification theories we know that inequality is intersectional and cross-cutting um, but we don't have a very good way often of putting those kinds of insights together uh, and thinking about what you know could could the insights from formal modeling extend to these more socially realistic situations? And so this was an effort to do that. Um, that found though that uh, when we do that, uh, that actually in a more um, substantively realistic case, what we've learned from the formal models doesn't necessarily extend or apply very well at all. So that's a kind of disquieting conclusion of this piece of research. Uh, and thank you. Yeah. The modern community about the idea that this is a this is a concept. It wasn't meant to be brought to data, you know. And so people, I think, were initially resistant. And, and yet, if you believe this works, then in theory, we should be able to understand it in some way with some kind of measure. Yeah. I mean, we have a problem. Like, we don't want to end up back like Fogel, right? And so, uh, you know, this was. Uh, we don't want to end up in a situation where we're looking at these mortality disparities and saying like, boy, you know, blacks in old age looks like they're doing great, you know? Like, so there's a sense in which it's like mortality selection theory clearly seems to be getting something right because otherwise I don't, I don't know what other interpretation we have of this phenomenon, right? So we, th I do think there's something that's really right in this theory, but yeah, we should, we want to be able to ask much better questions like, what is this frailty? Like, what are its major components? How do they work? But if we want to do that, then we have to be able to actually engage with like, well, what happens when we measure part of it and you don't measure another part? And so that gap between these like kind of stylized and arid models and then the real data, I don't see any way around trying to close that gap. Um, but it's not really clear to me how to do it. And you can see this is still a super stylized and arid model, right? And already, you know, it really breaks down. Yeah. And historically, Fogel didn't have access to the same data richness that we do today. And I, has anybody gone back and sort of tried to mimic the literature in the sense of the evolution of data versus the evolution of the understanding of the processes you're talking about? I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse him or let him off yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at all. He made a very compelling case there. But, but some of it had to do just with the fact that he couldn't quantify features yeah, I mean, what's crazy, I think, about reading Fogel's work on this is, like, it's so good, like, it's so creative and careful in a million different ways, but he, he, he doesn't have the concept of mortality selection. And so, like, he's puzzling like crazy over this result. He ends up, like, developing all these auxiliary theories around it to try to make sense of it because it seems so anomalous. Um, so, and, and it's super creative in the way that it marshals like a million different kinds of pieces of data to try to make sense of it, but it's, it's like the one piece that was missing was just the idea that like, no, survivors are really different from an original birth cohort when you've been in a condition where mortality is so high. So, 
Yeah, I don't know. So he, some of his students have done more, um, you know, more research on the same topics with more modern kind of um, methods and assumptions. What I think is sort of crazy about the Fogel case is that like, it's, it's, to it's literally at the center of everything that demographers know about and care about Fogel for. And we never even talk about it as an example of the crossover. And I think there's some like, uh, some kind of interesting reasons for that historiography that are sort of um, worth thinking about that um, that maybe I won't get into because I don't know how to do it concisely. But it's like uh, it, it, uh, to me, that's the most interesting part of it. No, not at all. Yeah. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about, okay, so you see this problem, you find it phenomenally interesting. You know, how did you dig, your, dig into it and where did you get help? Yeah. So, okay, so one thing I should say is that the reason why this is all using binary categories is that I'm not that great at math and that made the math tractable for me and it let me have intuitions about all of the equations in a way that is harder for me. Um, with, um, so that's one reason why these models are not super realistic. Someone who's better at math, I think, could have done it in a more realistic way and retained intuitions about it, um, which I didn't think that I could. The way I got into it was um, I was originally interested in another problem, mortality deceleration, which actually the graph that I showed um, that just came from another paper, this was a, um, a from a paper I wrote about mortality deceleration, and it came from um, something that I was reading, uh, a paper that I like a lot by Scott Lynch, um, and it made some assumptions, and it didn't write down the model, and I thought, I'm just gonna write down the model and like figure out how that works. And when I wrote it down and started playing around with it, I realized that like one of the assumptions that was kind of implicit in the paper wasn't true. And so I got really interested in that, um, and that ended up being what my first um, paper as a grad student was about. Um, and so I really learned to do this kind of math like through having that applied problem and figuring out how to write down the models for the actual process that I was trying to model. I didn't come to it with already having those math skills and then recognizing them. Um, and most people who do the kind of work that I do come at it at a really different way. They mostly have an engineering background and it gives them, I think, a, a huge advantage in that they can see structural similarities between kinds of um, population situations that are not really accessible to me um, because I don't see them right off the bat. Um, but I think, you know, the, to make the best of, of you know, the situation you're in or whatever, I think the advantage that I do have is that because I had to work harder to get the intuitions for what I have, my intuitions are closer to the substance. Uh, and that can be a double-edged sword, um, but it can be helpful, I think, for sometimes being able to think about like, you know, hey, like this model is actually saying something kind of crazy about how racism works. I don't think that is how it works, so. If you're in a if you're in a boat like me, you know that's maybe the advantage that you'll have is like bringing more sense of realism to the models. Um, if if you come at it in a way that is closer to the substance of what they're saying. What has the response been to using this measure? So, so I haven't actually I I haven't presented this um, lately with the. Um, with the attempt to um, calibrate and validate it, because that's like more recent. Um, I would say that people who are farther afield from this literature like this work a lot, and people who are close to this literature are sometimes um, somewhat hostile to it, and part of that has to do with, um, in this particular area, there is a model that is like pretty, 
conceptually dominant, which is the gamma distributed frailty model. And there's a sort of general way of working with it that is a bit hegemonic in that area. And I think it can be hard um, doing things in a different way to, to reach people who are used to doing it in, it in that way and have them kind of understand what I'm trying to do. So that has been a, a challenge like in review processes and things like that. I guess. Okay. I'm just going to go to the simulations and, and ask sort of a very general um, mindset question. Please do. When you're about to launch, what do you need to be a week long or a, I don't know how long, 10 day long simulation? What, when do you, what are the steps that you take to feel ready to finally click? and know that the next thing is going to be 10 days later. That's an interesting question. Well, so one thing is, I hope it's going to be 10 days later because what usually happens first is that it's like 20 seconds later because of some error, right? I mean, obviously the worst outcome is it runs all week before you figure out there's an error. But like, you know, I do... Uh, I, I do end up running bad versions many times and then realizing and fixing them. Um, but, I mean, a week is a long time to run something, and I feel bad saying this with Russell in the room, but like, you know, but computing power is like pretty cheap, you know, and I feel like it, if I feel like I'm gonna actually learn something from doing it, um, then I wanna go ahead and do it. I, I heartily agree. Oh, good. <laughs> got servers for a reason. <laughs> yeah. But I guess, is there a way that you broke your data down into smaller pieces to see, to figure it out before? Oh, yes. This is a great question. Yeah. So this is like, I forget how many uh, simulated cohorts this is, but it's like, you know, many, many hundreds of thousands. Um, before I tried to run that, I did versions that were like 10 simulated cohorts and could run like instantaneously on my laptop. Um, to make sure that like the code is trying to do the right thing and that the results seem intelligible. I definitely recommend that. How many of you have come across frailty before uh, in competitions at PAA or, I mean, I know we talked about it in DevTech, so, but I mean, in, a, in other conversations. Is it usually, is it a new, that's cool. I was just curious about the, you know, the crosswalk that she's trying to do here is actually, it's, it's a really big deal in some sense. I don't really know anybody else trying to walk this line. Yeah. So in any event, um, and so the thinking about the fact that you've got these underlying individual parameters that aggregate up to a population level trend, I mean, this is something that we can think about for a lot of processes besides mortality, right? We think about it for divorce hazard, or the underlying divorce hazard, marital hazard, fertility, right? You've got some underlying process, and then it's aggregated across people and generating patterns. And, you know, so, so I think there's a translation between what she's doing and what I know a lot of you are interested in think about families and fertility or inequality or um, immigration propensities, right? And, and so the issue is that 50 years ago, 40 years ago, we just saw those population aggregates, right? And so we had to come up with some inference about some underlying process to, to take apart puzzles in those population aggregates, right? And so what Elizabeth's done here is has a translation to many of the other things that you might be thinking about. So I hope that part of this is clear. If you work on a problem that has a duration in it, exactly. or anything else where if the thing happens to you, you're no longer eligible to have it happen to you, duration of first birth, you know, whatever it is, that, um, then you should worry about this kind of selection process. And then we're actually just going to go 